The Bible was written and preserved to enlighten mankind about God. So why does mainstream Christianity teach that God is a mystery? And now, Garner Ted Armstrong. Who and what is God? There are thousands of books written by philosophers, educators, clerics, religious people about God in all kinds of different tongues, languages, and from all many different nations, different kinds of ideas about God, such as Buddha, Shinto, Dagon, Vishnu, Allah. Millions of people, a billion point some odd million, believe in Allah. Is God Allah or is God God in the English language? Does God consist of Father and Son, as the Bible says, or is He like a triumvirate, like a three-part something or other, which you cannot understand? As a matter of fact, before I came on the uh, program here, my son and I were talking about the fact that a major leading evangelist had been asked to kind of explain the idea of the Trinity, and, and he was saying words that he affect, well, it's, it's like three in one and one in three, and it's, uh, it's hard to understand. It's, it's a mystery, but he went on to say that it is virtually a sign of your faith. So in other words, you must profess to believe in something that you cannot understand. If your religion, if you understand your religion, is it any good to you? And it, you know, is it any good at all if you understand your religion? Shouldn't it just be something where you go around, you dress funny, you make funny signs, you do something, and you make a little sign with your hands. You sit around like one of these fellows I saw over there in Afghanistan the other day, sitting against a wall with his turban or whatever on, and he was contemplating these beads. Many different religions have beads. There were those who, uh, I forget, it was kind of a hippie kind of religion that believed that they had to keep their index finger out of the bean bag and the rest of their fingers, they're, they're going through these beads. But anyway, there are hundreds, thousands, I suppose, of ideas. But to me, here's the way I approach it. Is there a God and can you prove it? Can you prove it scientifically? Can you discover that there are proofs of God that will hold up in scientific studies, the natural sciences, such as history, geology, archaeology, paleontology, historic and dynamic geology? How did energy come to be? What is law? What is the origin of things? What is life and where did it come from? Why is it cyclical? Why is it always requiring pre-existing life of the same kind? What are the absolute proofs that you could present that there is no other explanation for intricacy, for symbiosis, for the operation of the tremendous powers that affect our Earth. Why do we have true north and magnetic north? Why does water go counterclockwise down your drain in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere? Why are you 8,000 miles above people straight through the Earth from you who think they're on the top of the Earth? What is the journey on this Earth all about, our lifespan? Here's a book in front of me that is called the Bible. Mine is rather worn. I've got another one I couldn't even put on the desk here because the pages are so tattered. Look at this one. It's got tape on it and everything here. That has been completely worn out in my more than 45 years of using it in the radio and television studios to page through and to teach from. And here is a book that is for all the world like the book you get when you buy a brand new vehicle that you will find in the glove compartment. It is a book that tells you all about the vehicle you have bought, who made it, how it runs, how to take care of it, how it's supposed to be repaired, all the things you're supposed to do. It's called the handbook or a guidebook of this piece of transportation you bought. Well, here in the Bible is the handbook from the Creator to His creation to tell us all about Him, who and what He is, what He is like, what are his powers? What is his purpose? What is his plan? How many members of this family, if it is a family, are there? Or is it a kind of a blob, a kind of a triumvirate, three in one, one in three, which you can never understand? I have something for you I want you to get that will clear up an awful lot of confusion, knock a lot of cobwebs out of a lot of people's minds. Is God a mystery? Now, that would be really a puzzle, wouldn't it? Here is a book, great big, thick book. I mean, look at all of the pages and the chapters of the Bible, every bit of it telling you about God, about God and the devil and about Jesus Christ, about good and bad, about this physical life and about the life after death, what happens when we die. It's all there. And yet to many people, 
they would rather have God, I think, be a mystery because mysteries don't tell you what to do. They don't regulate your life. They don't present you with choices. They don't tell you if you make the wrong choice, you're going to get some hard knocks. This booklet, Is God a Mystery?, goes into the fact that there is a verse in your Bible in 1 John, the fifth chapter. I won't tell you which verse. I'll let you look it up and get it in the booklet. That was deliberately inserted there by those who wanted to preach, proclaim, and who believed in the idea of the Trinity. And the verse never found its way into some of the Latin manuscripts until long after the invention of printing by the time of the Gutenberg Bible. It's in this booklet. This tape, a full-length sermon delivered before a live audience, must you believe in the Trinity to be saved? Now, you can have both absolutely free of charge if you will dial 903-561-7070. 903-561-7070. Free of charge, no price whatsoever. You can read it, and then if you're through with it and don't agree with it, well, that's your problem. You can look it up in the Scriptures, as I always say, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. By the way, before I pick up the subject again, you notice my tie today? Isn't that a beauty? Uh, I'm being very patriotic right now, but I want to thank uh, Richard and Nancy Anderson, who are good friends of mine who live over in uh, Savannah, Georgia. They sent me this necktie. I guess they didn't know I was wearing my Antietam hat with my ribbons on it, being a little patriotic these days because of the... Uh, problems that our country has been experiencing, but it's a beautiful tie, so I decided to wear it on television. It says in Hebrews, the first chapter, God, who at sundry times and in different manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, that is, through the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds, or as it says in the original, the ages, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, that says so much it would require about five sermons of an hour apiece to even tell you all that is in that verse of the Bible. The fact that Christ is clearly said to be the one who made the world, the universe, the solar system, and all things in it. He is said to have such power that He upholds everything from gravity, inertia, and the laws of falling bodies, and so on, by His Word. It says that He is the brilliant, beautiful, just incredibly, what, glorified, express image, stamped, impress, perfect replica, representative, representative of the Father. You know, I've, I've heard from these people that say that God is kind of like a blob, a tripartite something or other, three and one, one and three, and they can't explain it and say, but, but it's, a, it's a sign of your faith. You've got to just accept it. I know you don't understand it. Uh, what does it have? Is there three, like three faces? Is it, are they all one? Are they together? Do they walk around together? Do they float around together? Uh, they can't explain it to you, and the word Trinity is, of course, nowhere from Genesis to Revelation. That's true, though, of a lot of the doctrines that people believe in. The doctrine itself is found nowhere in the Bible. They have to tell you, well, it's implied here and there. But that's why I say, here is a book that is trying to tell you all about God, all about Christ the Son, all about your place in the scheme of things, who you are, why you're here, where you're going, what happens when you die. And instead of looking at what this book says, people listen to what some Holy Joe tells them. Now, that's not surprising in a lot of nations where people in time past, and to some extent even today, are not even allowed to own this book. You see, there are nations, even in Europe, big nations, where a very large, up in the 90 percentile and above of the population are members of a great universal church, where they will go to church and hear their religious services dictated to them or spoken to them in a foreign language that they don't even understand. And they are not told that they ought to study the Bible like a lot of the Protestant religions will. I mean, Baptist, Church of Christ, uh, a lot of other churches I could mention, Seventh-day Adventist, uh, certainly the church of which I'm president, the Intercontinental Church of God says, study to show thyself approved. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Study the Bible. That's why it was given to us. 
it is here to study, to read, to come to understand. I mean, you know, Islamic clerics say to study the Koran, and they interpret the Koran to you and tell you what it says. I have studied for all these many, many decades of my adult life, I didn't when I was younger, the Bible, which I hold to be the word of Almighty God to his subjects, to his creation, to tell us what we're all about, where we're going, what happens to us when we die, what is the ultimate human potential. Now, in this word, it says that God is a father God, and it says that Jesus Christ is his son. It says that Christ is the first begotten among all human creatures, and that at the resurrection of Christ, he is the first born among many brethren. Now, if you read that in the newspaper about a family somewhere, maybe a sergeant that comes back from uh, Afghanistan, he's the firstborn among many brethren. He's, oh, well, he's the eldest of a bunch of brothers. No problem at all. But if it's in the Bible, it's just people go tilt, doesn't mean a thing, because all of the spiritual mumbo jumbo they've heard all their lives, it got them so confused that it's like some kind of a rapid video game with about four or five handles, and they don't have enough thumbs and, and hands and so on to manipulate it. moving so fast, they're just all confused, and they don't know anything about it. And that's the way it is with most people when it comes to the doctrines of the Bible. When I want to come back and tell you about the fact that God Almighty is described to us as basically having human form, believe it or not. Take a look at this. Be sure to get this material, and I'll be right back. Is God a mystery? Is it required that you accept the doctrine of the Trinity in order to be saved? A careful reading of the Athanasian Creed contained in the Catholic Encyclopedia is an exercise in confusion. What about the Holy Spirit? The Bible likens it to a mighty rushing wind and the element of fire. But is the Holy Spirit a third person, part of an unfathomable Godhead in which there are no individuals? Clear up the confusion when you read your free copy of Is God a Mystery? You'll also receive the sermon tape, Must You Believe in the Trinity to be Saved? They're yours free of charge when you call 903-561-7070. In the Bible, we are told that there is God the Father and there is Jesus Christ the Son. We're told by many scriptures that the Father has eyes, ears. His ears are open to our cry. His eyes behold all that goes on down here below. His arm is not shortened that it cannot save. And so we're told that man was made in the image of God, Genesis 1, 26. Elohim said, let us, notice the plural, make man in our image and after our likeness. So we know God is not a blob. He's not a wraith. He's not a fog. He's not a drifting cloud. He's not just a pond full of water. He's not a first cause. He is and has a shape and a form much like ours, but he is supremely powerful, all powerful, and he has a son who was sent to this earth who was born of the Virgin Mary. Now this is fascinating. Look at Luke, the first chapter there in your own home, and just turn to and read verse 35. Here is the annunciation by an archangel to Mary that said very clearly when she is saying, well, how can this be that I have known no man? And that she was told that she was going to become the mother of a, the holy thing that is begotten in thee, shall be called the Son of God. She thought, how can this happen? He said, the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, and that holy thing which is born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now, wait a minute. If the Holy Spirit is a person, is the third person of the Trinity, and the Bible specifically and plainly tells you in Luke, 21, in Luke 1, 35, that the Holy Spirit was the causal factor in the engenderment of Jesus Christ in the womb of the Virgin Mary, then why did Jesus Christ pray to the wrong Father? And also, since he goes on to say the power of the highest, and that's a hypersuperlative, there can't be a, a higher than that. Highest is the hypersuperlative. The power of the highest shall come over thee. And if the Holy Spirit was a person, then that makes the Holy Spirit higher than God the Father. Puzzling, isn't it? Well, it really isn't. 
when you understand what the Holy Spirit really is, and that's what you will get when you get this material. For example, the Bible does not say that God the Father is poured out, but it says the Holy Spirit is and was. I will pour out my Spirit. The Bible says that the Father has a Spirit, the Spirit of the Father. I will pour out my spirit. My spirit shall not long contend with man, etc. Time and time again, the expression from God himself that God has a spirit. Christ said, God is a spirit, and them that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It also talks about the fact that the patriarchs and men like David had the spirit of Christ which was in them, and Jesus Christ had a spirit. Now, get ready for this. If the Holy Spirit is a person... Does the Spirit have a spirit? Puzzling, isn't it? Well, it isn't if you understand the truth. It isn't if you just read the Bible the way it is. Now, many months, a year or two or three ago, maybe further than that, I remember one of these people trying to really uh, get across the idea that Trinity was saying, no, you cannot refer to God as a person. They were writing kind of an apologetic thing about why they had gone from the concept of God as a family named divine Elohim, meaning more than one, which can have more than one brother because Christ is the firstborn among many brethren and that others are to be born of God. And they were explaining why they had absolutely jettisoned that doctrine and they had adopted the doctrine of the triumvirate or the tripartite or the Trinity. And so they were saying, you cannot refer to God as a person. Well, let's see here. Uh, it says here in Hebrews 1 and verse 3 about Christ, who being the brightness of his glory, the brilliance of the great glorified power of God, and the express image, and in the original Greek the word is character, K-A-R-A-K-T-E-R, -E express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his... Now, why can't I refer to God as a person? I mean, since my Bible refers to him as a person, is it okay if I refer to him as a person? Well, these people said, no, you cannot refer to God as a person. Well, they can have it their way, and, and I'll have it my way, and my way is the Bible way. I'll have it the Bible way. I'll do it the way the Bible says. Actually, there is no inference, no hint whatever in the Word of God that there is such thing as a trinity. Christ did not preach it. It is only because in the Greek the word he, which can be ekinos, and it can be he, or it, or they, or that one, or that thing, or even she, but mostly it is masculine. And if you look it up in Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, it is actually stated many times in the Bible that it is like the power of God, the mind of God, the life of God. The Holy Spirit is likened unto a mighty roaring wind. Look at the second chapter of Acts. It is like an unto rivers of living water. Christ said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. It is like an unto cleansing water, water the greatest solvent of every liquid that there is. It is like an unto the life-giving properties of water. I will give you the true water to drink, said Jesus to the Samaritan woman at the well. He that drinketh of this water shall never thirst. And it's talking about the life and the mind and the nature and the character of God. It's talking about the life-giving Spirit of God. It's talking about being begotten of the Holy Spirit. Now, since the Holy Spirit is that which begets the children of God, why are they called the children of God instead of the Spirit, uh, children of the Holy Spirit? Well, you'll get it all when you get the booklet, and I want you to be sure to do that. So I'm going to take another quick time out and let you have a chance to get that telephone number and get this material. Must you believe in the Trinity to be saved? And some people will tell you, and when I come back, I want to tell you something that was absolutely outrageous as to why I was not allowed on a major television network in these United States. I'll be right back. What about the Holy Spirit? The Bible likens it to a mighty rushing wind and the element of fire. But is the Holy Spirit a third person, part of an unfathomable Godhead in which there are no individuals? Clear up the confusion when you read your free copy of Is God a Mystery? You'll also receive the sermon tape, Must You Believe in the Trinity to be Saved? They're yours free of charge when you call 903-561-7070. 
Some years ago, I was attempting to get on one of the large cable networks in the United States, sent them a whatever, one or two of my programs for them to take a look at. They rejected them and they sent back. It was actually something they didn't want to put in writing. I wish they had, but uh, they just told a gentleman on the telephone that worked for me at that time, no, we can't let Garner Ted's program on this network because you see, we are a Christian network. Now that was very, very enlightening to me because of course, since 1953, I have thought of myself as a Christian having been baptized, receiving the laying on of hands for the Holy Spirit of God, having accepted the Word of God, having admitted and confessed to God, not only then, but many a time in my lifetime that I've committed some sins that I need to be forgiven for. And I look at what Peter said to those stricken people in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It says for the remission of sins, of course, meaning the forgiveness of the breaking of God's Ten Commandments, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I believe all these things that the Apostle Paul said before Agrippa, which almost got him killed at that time, believe all that it says here in the first chapter, second chapter, and all the rest of the chapters in the book of Hebrews. Now, for example, here is a gentleman, the Apostle Paul, who is striving to tell the entire story about the Savior of all mankind to people who had rejected him by and large. So he writes this letter to the diaspora, the scattered Jewish people all over the known world of that time, who were called, well, the, the Hebrews or the diaspora of the Jews. And he begins to get right to the subject of the fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah that they'd been expecting but that they had rejected. Now he comes directly to the point in the very first two verses that I read to you at the beginning of this program. And notice what he says in verse 5 of the very first chapter. Under which of the angels did he say at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee? But we read in Luke 1 and verse 35 that Mary was told that the Holy Spirit would overshadow her. So if the Holy Spirit is a person, how is it that God the Father is saying here, this day have I begotten thee, unless the power, the divine miracle working power of Almighty God was accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit, which flows from God toward the person or the object of the power that he is causing to either light upon them or engender life within them or to change their mind from carnal to spiritual or whatever it is that he's doing. He says, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and Christ is called the only begotten among all of mankind. Prior to that time, there had never been a human being that was begotten of the Father. And Jesus, when he said we should pray, he told us, say, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And he omits any mention right there of saying that the Holy Spirit was his Father. Now it goes on to say in Hebrews 1, and again, I will be to him a Father and he shall be to me a Son. In this world of ours, among all of the handiwork of God, you see duality. Why is there the North Pole and the South Pole? Why is there positive and negative? in the magnetic fields. Why is there, are there two sexes wherever you look? Two nostrils, two eyes, two ears, two hands, two legs, two feet. Why are there the two sexes among all the mammals and animals and birds and fish and insects and everything else? Why is there, in a sense, duality wherever you look unless you're looking at the handiwork of the one who actually created it who said, let us Notice the plural, make man in our image. And the word for God in your Bible, in the English language, comes from a Hebrew word, Elohim, and the I am on the end of that word means more than one, which is why you see God saying, let us make man in our image, because it was both of them, and Jesus Christ had a pre-existent state when he was with God. Read John the first chapter in your own home. Just sit down. Let me give you a little advice. Sit down and read John, the first chapter, the Gospel of John, in the same way you would read your no morning newspaper. Well, maybe not because a lot of people don't believe what's in a newspaper, but I mean, read it the way you would a textbook in which you have a certain amount of confidence. 
and don't expect someone else to tell you it doesn't mean what it says. It says, in the beginning was the Word, capital letter W, because the translators knew it referred to Christ, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If you look at the original, it was, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with Theos, and the Logos was Theos. And Theos is plural, and is the exact synonym in Greek for the Hebrew Elohim, which means more than one, which is why he said, let us make man in our image. So the Word was a part of the divine Elohim, which was more than one. All things were made by Him. Why won't they preach that? Why will not thousands of ministers in pulpits by the thousands all over our country and all over the whole English-speaking, and for that matter, Latin and Greek, Hebrew, or, or French or German-speaking, so-called nominal Christian world, why will they avoid John the first chapter expounding and explaining it like they will avoid a case of beriberi or sleeping sickness? They will not come near it because it knocks into the head a lot of the doctrines they hold dear. When you see that Jesus Christ was the individual of divine Elohim who wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger, when you see that he was the one who wrestled in the dust of the earth with Jacob, when you see that he personally was the one who ate a meal with Abraham and sat there in the, in the plain of Mamre with the other two angelic beings who went on their way to rescue Lot, and how Abraham argued with this member of divine Elohim who manifested himself as a human being and actually ate a lamb roast and drank milk and sat there and chatted with Abraham. When you understand that the one you and I know of as Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the one who is the Creator who said, let there be light, let the dry land appear, let us make man in our image, an awful lot of things come clear. For example, the idea that the Old Testament is done away, the idea that Christ nailed the commandments to His cross, all these ideas that Christ came like the young man to absolutely destroy everything His Father had ever done, overthrow it, overturn it, rescind it, do a, destroy whatever, destroy it. And a lot of people believe that because they think it was so harsh, you know, to not murder somebody, I guess, and avoid coveting, and to have only one God before you, and honor your parents, and so on. It really, to give you a clue, as I've done before, the one commandment that our Sunday observing nominal so-called Christian world really gets uptight about is the fourth one. As I've said before, to be joking about it, found somewhere between the third and fifth commandment. That's why they would like to do away with it. Well, your, your Bible says very clearly that Jesus Christ is the one who made the world. It says in verse 10 of Hebrews 1, it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. You ought to read those verses and believe them just the way they are. Be sure to get this material. God shouldn't be a fathomless mystery to you. It doesn't need to be some kind of a blob or a tripartite something that you'll never understand. And this booklet will help clear out a lot of the confusion and the cobwebs in a lot of people's minds. And also this stand-up sermon before a live audience, Must You Believe in the Trinity? When you can't even explain it or understand it in order to be saved, 903-561-7070. That's 903-561-7070, and I'll see you here in one week. All GTA materials are free. Sermons are available on tape or CD with some titles available on DVD. Call 1300-885-066.